are you? I'm doing very good. How are you? I am doing good. Thank you. And so can you start by introducing yourself, telling us a bit about your background and what inspired you to become a writer? Sure. So my name is Erin Bow. Um, I live in Kitchener, Ontario, not too far from Toronto. And I write children's books and poetry. And I write about uh, science for a living. Like I write mm -hmm. science articles about things like black holes. I like my job. I, uh, I've always been the kid with my nose in my books. Um, and I've always loved books a lot. But somehow it didn't occur to me that you could write books for a living until I was like 25, 30 years old. So I actually studied physics and uh, and didn't start writing novels until I was about 30. Oh. Um, so I've had kind of a different, uh, kind of an interesting career path. Mm. But I've always loved books. I love stories. I love books for young readers are my favorite books. Uh, and so when I started writing books, I just sort of automatically started writing yeah. books for young readers. So I write mostly middle grade and young adult. I write fantasy I write contemporary stories. I write science fiction. Mm. <laughs> I have a lot of animals in my books and in my life. Mm. That's adorable. Um, how did you get the idea for the um, dog, um, Herc? Is, did you get the idea from your own dog? From Luna? A little bit. I the always the illustration have looks the same, book. sort of. Yeah, they do kind of look the same, don't they? Mm -hmm. uh, Luna is a golden doodle and Hercules mm. is a golden retriever. So they're sort of cousin species. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like animal people relationships in books. Mm -hmm. So I wrote one book that's got a girl who has a talking cat. And I wrote one book that's got a girl who's training um, a hunting eagle. And then in Simon sort of says, my latest book, um, Simon is helping to raise a puppy that they're hoping will be a guide dog, mm. but actually Simon and Hercules, the guide dog, bond themselves, and mm, so okay. Hercules doesn't go off to guide dog school. He just yeah, stays. well, I, that's that's good for Hercules because honestly, I would think guide dog school would be a tiny bit boring. <laughs> yeah, they develop some real interesting skills there. It takes a special mm. kind of dog. True. What inspired you to write Simon Sort of Says? So Simon Sort of Says is um, a middle grade book. So you remember I just said that I, I trained to be a physicist, right? So I am specifically a particle physicist. They're the people that crash two things together and see what happens in the mess and see what they can learn about ideas by like colliding two things at high energy. And I usually find my books are kind of the same way. I think I have one idea but it doesn't actually work until I hit it with another idea at like yeah. full speed and create a terrible mess. Yeah, um, well, this book wasn't a terrible mess. It was an awesome one. Oh, thank you. So it, it was a terrible mess at first and then I cleaned it up into an awesome mess. But an awesome mess is a, is a really good description of Simon sort of says mm -hmm. because it's, it's a funny book, um, mm -hmm. but it's also a serious book, right? It's a, it's a <laughs> book about a boy. About it, I mean, Simon sort of says is sort of like I mean Simon is sort of like a mess a bit, but yeah. he's awesome. So <laughs> technically, if you collide those together, awesome mess. Yeah. So yeah. he's he's it's a funny book, but it's a book about recovering from trauma, right? He's mm -hmm. been through something terrible, so it's got that serious thing in it too. Um, but it's also about like there are people in the town who are listening, who are running a project to track signals from outer space and try to find space aliens. Yeah. And there are people in the town who have an emu farm. And there are people like Simon's dad um, is a pastor at the church and Simon's mom is an undertaker. And so there's weird stuff at the church and there's a point where the funeral home loses a body. Yeah. And it's it's an awesome mess. I think awesome mess is a great way to describe it. Uh, how'd you come up with the idea for the characters Agate, Kevin and um, Simon? Um, Simon came first. So Simon is the lead character and yeah. he just popped onto the page that first chapter in the first chapter, Simon tells, um, the readers why they moved away from Omaha. And it's a story about like his father was doing a blessing at the church and then there was a disaster and there's an alpaca and an owl and yeah, it's, it's, and there's a the girl who got the blessed sacrament. Yes. Um, so 
he just kind of, he started telling that story and just from his voice, I could tell a lot about who he was. Mm -hmm. um, so Simon wasn't a lot of work. Um, usually characters just kind of come to me. Secondary mm -hmm. characters are a little bit harder. Um, Kevin was kind of hard to create. Kevin is Simon's friend and his mom is a scientist in the town, but he's mm -hmm. kind of a, he's just a really nice guy. He is. Yeah, he's just, that's that's Kevin's defining trait is he's a really yeah. nice guy. Um, Agate is the gift of the book. She's the thing that I didn't expect. Yeah. She just walked onto the page. Agate is the character in the book who thinks it's a really good idea to fake a message from space aliens. Yeah. And she's there because I needed a character in the book who thought it was a really good idea to fake a message from space aliens because that makes the plot go. Um, but she walks onto a scene in like chapter three and just walks away with the book. She comes to life and she steals absolutely every scene she's in. She wasn't supposed to do that. She was supposed to be a very minor character. Um, mm -hmm. She was supposed to be such a minor character that I actually gave her the name of my daughter's cat. Not this black one you see crawling around, but a yeah. Little tabby we have named Agate, who's probably too important to come out and see us right now. <laughs> but yeah, I I gave her a placeholder name, mm -hmm. um, and then she walked away with the whole story. Yeah, she's like, at when after I read the book, I felt like her. I mean, I didn't really feel like there were secondary characters. I felt like, um, well. I mean, Kevin was a very very good job of doing a secondary character. But you're right. Like I get. Agate is like, Agate is like in every single scene almost. Yeah. I think if you went and counted, you'd be surprised. She's not in every single scene. But she's such a big presence in the book that she just kind yeah. of takes it over. She Every scene she's in becomes an Agate scene. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I like her very much. Um, she's, um, and I'm very pleased to have, she's an autistic character. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very pleased to have some autistic characters on the page who are just kind of out there being awesome. Yeah. And their autism isn't a source of trauma to them. And it's not a problem that the story has to solve. Mm -hmm. It's just who they are. And they're amazing. The problem. Because, I mean, it's like, it's just like girls are girls and boys are boys. That's not a problem. Yep. Autistic kids are autistic kids. That's mm -hmm. not a problem. You're exactly right about that. I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> um so how'd you come up with the name of the town grin and barrett grin and barrett nebraska um i don't know exactly i um i, I wanted it to have a very silly name that and was i started very silly. looking at very silly names uh for towns in the united states and realized that it could be a very silly name and still be a realistic town <laughs> true there's like a Tightwad, Missouri, and a Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And um, there's a Come by Chance in Newfoundland, which means we kind of ended up there, um, which is named that because the boat landed there. And then they're like, well, okay, guess this is where we are. Um, so there are all kinds of crazy yeah. names. And I just wanted a crazy name, but I also wanted it to sort of just tip towards the plot just a little bit. Um, so, you know, grin and bear, it means to shut up and smile. And Simon kind of has this trauma in his background and he's trying to like shut up and smile about it. Um, yeah. but it turns out that he actually needs to talk about it. I feel like he was sort of setting up, shutting up and smiling about it when, um, he found all these problems with the plan and he didn't tell a gate. He was just like shutting up and he was just smiling and telling him it was a good idea. And he didn't really like mm -hmm. let her know. Yeah, he does that a little bit. Um, yeah. His parents call it his Simon Says mode, which is why the book is kind of, well, it's not why the book is called what it is, but it makes sense of the title. Yeah, um, yeah he just, sometimes he just kind of nods and smiles and doesn't doesn't worry yeah. about it too much. Well, so how'd you come up with um, the title? The title was really hard to come up with, believe it or not. I know it looks like an obvious title. So it was a long process getting the title. When I was first writing it, I called it Shelter in Place. 
And then I went, that's really, it's too dark. It's too grim. And then we were all in a lockdown, like after I started writing it and we all had to shelter in place. So I was like, okay, maybe not. <laughs> uh, and I called it Simon from now for a while, but that's a pun about general relativity. And yeah. so, you know, I decided maybe a pun about general relativity was not the way to go. <laughs> um, my publisher called it anyway. That's what I tell people for a bit, but. Um, we decided no one was going to be able to remember that, including me. Can you tell us about the process of writing the book? Uh, I think all writers are different. And for me, every book is different. So I'll tell you all about it. But if you're if you're writing a book and it doesn't look like this, don't worry about that. OK, um, this book started really fast for me. I like after the after the like ideas collided with each other and I had a brand new messy idea that was like in November of 2019 and then I wrote the first two thirds of it in December and and then the next January and then it kind of poked along for a while because 2020 turned out to be a disaster as you probably <laughs> remember <laughs> um, yeah and then you know and then finally it took maybe about two two and a half years to write a first draft and then there's a process with my agent where we improve it and then I finally sold it and then there's a whole publishing process mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um so can you tell us about the publishing process how long did it take okay so publishing processes almost always take 18 months two years unless something has gone wrong or unless there's a really big reason to rush and this one took about that long too um so first you have to find well you don't have to find an agent but I have an agent so I I, I sent it to my agent my agent had some notes on it to make it better so that we could sell it it's kind of like when your real estate agents like maybe you should paint the purple room beige right so we did some of that um, although mine was more like, let's paint the purple room a brighter purple because it's just a weird book. Um, and then uh, we we sent it out to a few folks. It's kind of an uphill sell because it's a very strange comedy. It's a very, it's a comedy about something really serious and not everybody thought that was a good idea or even, you know, in good taste. But well, after I read this book, I certainly thought that it was an awesome one. So... Oh. Thank it you, was everybody. a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> to put it into words. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I finally sold it. I sold it to Disney Hyperion. I sold it. My editor there, their name is uh, Rachel Stark. And then I worked with Rachel for, um, oh, a year and a half, maybe, mm -hmm. to finally get it right. Uh, it took me a bit of a time, a bit of a couple different tries to, to get it all polished up and... Yeah. Then there's a whole publishing process. There are proofreaders and copy editors, and they ask you what you think you might want on the cover, or they don't, and the cover just shows up one day. <laughs> um, and promotion and lots of different yeah. things. So the number of people that work on a traditionally published book, um, like Simon sort of says, is a really big number. It's such a big number that I had to write to my editor and say, I want to thank everybody but I need you to make me a list because I can't keep track. So if you actually look at the back of, of the book, know, there's, yeah, there's, there's like so three good. pages of thank yous of people who worked on the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what much of the theme do you hope young readers learn from this book? Um, this is kind of a story about healing and you know, so, something bad has happened to to Simon and he's become famous for it. And if you want to know what it is, it's in the flap copy. So if you're a person who something like bad has happened to you and you want to check that it's not that thing, I totally understand and I support that. So go check. Um, but, you know, it's kind of defined who he is, this terrible thing that happened in his past. And this whole story is kind of him slowly realizing that yeah this terrible thing happened to me but it's not everything it doesn't define who I am it's not my whole story it's That's just true. part of my story so it's always going to be part of what what has happened to him and who he is mm, true. by the end of this book he realizes that it's not the whole thing mm -hmm. and you know trauma and is really common in children and adolescents really common like one in 20 kids 
will have the disorder Simon has, which is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. um, for one reason or another. And I hope, you know, a good message to take from this book is maybe the message Simon takes from this book is like, yeah, the tough stuff is part of what's made you who you are, but it doesn't define you. You're so much more than that. It's just like a, it's like a huge nasty scar. Yeah. At some point or another, you're going to forget about it. And it's yeah. not big of a deal. Yeah. You got more skin than just the scar, right? True. Yeah. Yeah. Scars um, mean you survived, right? Scars mean you survived. True. True. If there's no scars to show, then, I mean, it's like it never even happened. But I think, I think scars are what make you feel brave the next time something bad happens. I hope so. Yeah. It makes you feel like I've already been through this. I've done this. I can do it again. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to young authors who are just starting to write? Um, maybe what I said earlier about not worrying too much about rules, right? Yeah. If you want to write something, go write it. Like, yeah. go ahead, start now. There's never going to be a perfect time to start. There's always going to be like something that's like, oh, I should study for finals and I'll start after finals. Um, there's never going to be a perfect time and you're never going to have everything you need. So you might as well jump in now, <laughs> yeah. right? It's never going to be right. So you might as well start now, start now and have fun with it. And don't pay too much attention to people who think that they know how you ought to write a book. They know what works for they them, <laughs> but you have to figure out what works for you. Yeah, they don't know how it works with you. Yeah. So if you could give one piece of advice to yourself by going back in time and you're just starting to write, what would it be? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, Maybe I'd tell myself not to worry quite as much, too. I, I wrote this first book really, really slowly, and it felt like kind of a waste of time. And if I could maybe tell my pe my past self that it's like, no, this is a delightful book that lots of people will read and some people will really like. Mm. And just give them that, give just give my past self that insurance. Yeah. Like, yeah, this will be a special book for somebody. Mm. That's my hope. Every time I write a book, I... It's very nice to have a shiny prize sticker. And I assume it would be very nice to make a best-selling list, although that's never happened to me. But what is the best thing is to make a book that's a special book for somebody. Mm. Well, for me, all the books I have are special books. Mm -hmm. And the most annoying part is when I get books from the library, I can't keep those special books. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. Well, you can see behind me that I have kept a lot of books, but if I had to buy all of the books, we wouldn't have a house to put them in. The library, uh, the library is an important resource. What do you enjoy doing for fun? Other than I, reading, of course. Oh, yeah. Other than reading, of course. Yeah. Um, I like science fiction on television. I like Star Trek. Uh, I love my garden. I spend a lot of time in my garden. Um, I obviously have kind of a thing with my animals with my pets and mm. uh, and that kind of thing I'm learning to paint Ooh, interesting yeah, I'm not I'm not very good at it but it's kind of nice to have one creative there's never art. a good art and there's yeah. never a bad art it's just art um I used to like to cook but I haven't done it too much recently as opposed to just you know spaghetti for supper <laughs> so I'm that hoping delicious. that eventually we can get back to dinner parties and Ooh, that sounds so interesting. Dinner parties are fun. I like to yeah. cook for friends. What other books are you planning to write? Well, I've always got a stack of books <laughs> on my goal. Um, and I'm interested in all kinds of things. Yesterday, I was starting to do some research about um, crows and how crows have their Ooh. own crow society. Because I'd really kind of like to write That's a book funny. about a crow society. That would be fun. Yeah. You should um, write a book about planet crow. Planet Crow. Yeah. Yeah. My my daughter over here in the corner who loves crows is like, yes, let's spend the next five years obsessed with crows. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So thank you so much for your time. It has been um, very nice talking with you. Um,